Now in our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1156 of This Week in Amateur Radio. NASA successfully executes the first powered flight on another planet. The FCC reissues that advisory originally released this past January, advising all radio users, including amateurs, not to use two-way radios when committing crimes. A California radio amateur helps rescuers to locate a lost hiker in the mountains. A local power utility in Oregon funds the purchase of solar-powered radios for a local radio club. The National Hurricane Conference is coming up, and the National Hurricane Center WX4NHC station test date is set. We will bring you all the details. Maglite -like Corporation celebrated World Amateur Radio Day by joining forces with the ARRL. We will have the details. The League and the American Red Cross renew their Memorandum of Understanding. Youth on the Air Summer Camp is a go for this summer. If you are looking for a new job, the ARRL is hiring. We will tell you all about it. And if you own a mobile device on the Android platform, DRM Digital Radio is now accessible on your device. We will tell you all about it and a lot more is straight ahead on today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, talks about how much power it takes to perform a single Google search. And he will have an update on the current chip shortages that we are experiencing. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, talks about the massive physics phenomenon, which is just over eight minutes away. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill looks at amateur radio in the early 1940s as amateur radio goes to war, and the FCC issues Order 87, which took all amateurs off the air in the United States. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will be here to talk about how to avoid the sudden stop. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from central New York in the sleepy town of Cortlandville, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from along the southern shore of Lake Ontario in Rochester, New York, where April showers arrived earlier this week and have decided to stay for a while, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where winter just doesn't seem to want to let go, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where the only things on vacation last week were my two old mixers. One has been fired, the other one retired, and a new one hired, and I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now, with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off this week's news in a first in human history. It only lasted a few minutes, but it was the moment of many lifetimes. Ingenuity, the drone aboard NASA's Perseverance Mars rover, took to the air on Monday, April 19th, marking the first powered controlled flight of an aircraft on another planet. With Mars's freezing temperatures, plus an atmospheric density that is 1% of Earth's and gravity one-third of Earth's, the challenge of achieving liftoff was different from what the Wright brothers faced in 1903 with their pioneering flight here on Earth. In fact, a tiny portion of the original Wright flyer was on board. Scientists at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California were hailing the pioneering flight as a Wright Brothers moment on Mars. The little drone achieved a height of about three meters during the 40-second flight. Data was sent back to Earth via the Mars rover. 
There will be other flights expected to be farther and at greater heights. NASA announced that this newest of all the airfields in the Red Planet would be named Wright Brothers Field. Following the flight, the International Civil Aviation Organization, an agency of the UN, gave NASA and the Federal Aviation Administration an official designator of IGY, the call sign for Ingenuity. On April 20th, the FCC's Enforcement Bureau issued a new enforcement advisory repeating the admonishments contained in a January advisory that no licensee or user of the amateur or personal radio services may use any radio equipment in connection with unlawful activities of any nature. The January 17, 2021 enforcement advisory issued for licensees and operators across all the radio services read as follows. The Enforcement Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission issues this enforcement advisory to remind licensees in the amateur radio service, as well as licensees and operators in the personal radio services, that the Commission prohibits the use of radios in those services to commit or facilitate criminal acts. The Bureau has become aware of discussions on social media platforms suggesting that certain radio services regulated by the Commission may be an alternative to social media platforms for groups to communicate and coordinate future activities. The Bureau recognizes that these services can be used for a wide range of permitted purposes, including speech that is protected under the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Amateur and personal radio services, however, may not be used to commit or facilitate crimes. Specifically, the Bureau reminds amateur licensees that they are prohibited from transmitting communications intended to facilitate a criminal act or messages encoded for the purpose of obscuring their meaning. Likewise, individuals operating radios in the personal radio services, a category that includes citizens' band radios, family radio service walkie-talkies, and general mobile radio service, are prohibited from using those radios in connection with any activity which is against federal, state, or local law. Individuals using radios in the amateur or personal radio services in this manner may be subject to severe penalties, including significant fines, seizure of the offending equipment, and in some cases, criminal prosecution. The Commission specifically cautioned that individuals found to have used radios in connection with any illegal activity are subject to severe penalties, including significant fines, seizure of the offending equipment, and in some cases, criminal prosecution. In addition, licensees should be aware that illegal operation in any service or band, including completely outside the amateur allocations, could potentially disqualify a person from holding any FCC license in any service, not just the amateur service. Any amateur observing a suspicious infraction that might be of a legal or criminal nature should report it to their local law enforcement office or the FBI. The keen and practiced eye of ARRL member Ben Kuo, AI6YR, helped guide rescuers to a hiker stranded on a mountainside on April 12th. With more details on the story, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters in Newington. Hiker Rene Compian, 45, had spent the night lost in a remote region of the Angeles National Forest after a concerned friend reported Compian missing on Monday. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department dispatched search and rescue teams. Although amateur radio played no direct role in the rescue, Quo cited his enthusiasm for technology and ham radio satellites and for summits on the air for helping him to develop the skills he needed to guide searchers to the most likely area. His talent is being able to match aerial photography with topographical maps, and that's what he did using a small photo of the hiker's legs dangling over the edge of the rocks and the valley below. Co said understanding RF propagation was key as well. The search and rescue teams were searching the other side of the mountain where there's no cell signals, said Co, who knew that from having hiked there before. A low-flying helicopter team spotted Campion, and he was airlifted to safety with only minor injuries. 
The sheriff's department credited Quo with saving them hours of fruitless searching. Quo said this was the first time he'd been involved in a rescue like this one. Check out the much longer Washington Post article on the web and an even longer one in the New York Times. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. This is actually very applicable to being a summits on the air activator map navigation skills, QO told ARRL. Also, understanding RF propagation was the key to this. The search and rescue teams were searching the other side of the mountain where there was no cell signal. QO knew that from having hiked there before, as QO described it, Compeyan was found between four summits of the on air peaks. Search and rescue teams were deployed in the Mount Waterman area of the San Gabriel Mountains to find the hiker. According to the L.A. Sheriff's Department, a low-flying helicopter team spotted him Tuesday afternoon between Triplets Rock and the east bump of Twin Peaks in the San Gabriel Mountains, and he was airlifted to safety with no serious injuries. QO pointed out that the rescuers in the likely search area by matching satellite images with what Compeyan had transmitted over Twitter. QO told the Los Angeles Times he was an odd hobby of looking at photos and determining where they had been taken. He was able to employ his skill to determine the hiker's likely location using the tiny photo the hiker had posted on Twitter that showed his legs in the valley below. As the newspaper reported on April 15th, when QO saw the photo posted by the Sheriff's Department, he set to work pulling publicly available satellite images and matching them to the vegetation and terrain below the hiker's legs. Kyo's eye was good, he said authorities, the GPS coordinates of the most likely area, and the rescue team found a man less than a mile from that location. As the LA Times reported, the area which Compian was located on these steep slopes was very difficult to access, requiring advanced climbing skills. The Sheriff's Department credited Kyo with saving them hours of fruitless searching. Kyo said this was the first time he'd been involved in a rescue like this one. The sun is shining in more ways than one, for the members of the Emergency Volunteer Corps of Nahalem Bay in Oregon. The local electric utility has given them a $5,000 grant to help them buy ham radio base stations that run on solar power. A GO box has already been designed to serve as a solar powered station with a 25 watt radio, antenna, battery, and solar panel and other equipment, enabling emails to be transmitted over the air. The Volunteer Corps plans to set the stations up around the northern part of Tillamook County as part of their long-range plan to help bolster the coastal region's resilience following any major calamity. This is included in an overall communications plan that incorporates general mobile radio service as well as amateur radio. According to an article in the Tillamook County Pioneer website, the region has more than 100 amateur radio operators and 400 more residents using GMRS. The 72nd meeting of the International DX Convention, a.k.a. Visalia, is now open for registration. The virtual two-day meeting sponsored by the Northern California DX Club will be held on Saturday, May 15th and Sunday, May 16th via Zoom webinars. In addition to a safe front row seat without having to leave home, participants will be able to attend eight DX-related webinars on Saturday eight vendor webinars on Sunday and will be eligible for door prizes. Advanced registration is required. All webinars will be recorded and posted later to the Northern California DX Club website. All Zoom webinars will be recorded and posted to the NC DXC website. The Caribbean Emergency and Weather Net, the CEWN, has been providing round-the-clock amateur radio operations during the La Soufriere volcanic eruption on the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Several neighboring islands are also being affected by the disaster. When responding to disasters and emergencies such as this, the CEWN utilizes 3.815 MHz and 7.188 MHz, both LSB and the CEWN is requesting that radio amateurs not involved in the volcano response please keep these frequencies clear. Again, that's 3.815 MHz and 7.188 MHz. And just in case you think it's all sounding a long way away, it's worth noting that well-equipped stations in Europe can easily be heard in the Caribbean at certain times of the day. As the amateur radio community grows and evolves, the need to better understand the preferences and expectations of amateur radio operators worldwide becomes increasingly important. 
Inspired by the new licensees joining amateur radio's ranks and the seasoned ones who continue to believe in its value, hamcensus.org is inviting all hams to take part in a unique survey. The project's founders are looking forward to responses from both the United States and the rest of the globe, notably from Canadian neighbors to the north, the large Japanese and Thai communities, and all other operators worldwide. Questions deal with operating preferences, gear, the shack, views on regulations, clubs and associations, and, importantly, about the future of amateur radio. K3MRI, co-admin of both Ham Census and Ham Community, says, We wanted to give operators a louder voice to better inform club leaders, associations, manufacturers, and also regulators. He continues, We all want the amateur radio community to grow organically and collaboratively, and for that we need to know what operators are thinking. K3MRI and his team are counting on operators, clubs, organizations, and even ham-related businesses to spread the word, ensuring there is a large sample of respondents of all ages, all interests, and all nationalities. Ham Census, which is divided into six parts, runs year-round, delivering constantly updated results. The only caveat is that, though it is absolutely free for all to take and use, only those who complete all six parts of the census have access to the full results. Importantly, after completing it, Ham Census is encouraging respondents to submit suggestions on how to improve both the questions and multiple choice answers, notably on everything that is cutting edge. As K3MRI states, if there's one thing all hams continue to prove, is that amateur radio innovation is alive and well. Ham Census takes about 40 to 45 minutes to complete. As part of the FCC's broadband data collection effort to collect comprehensive data on broadband availability across the United States, the Federal Communications Commission is encouraging the public to download the FCC's Speed Test application, which is currently used to collect speed test data as part of the FCC's Measuring Broadband America program. The app provides an easy way for consumers to test the performance of their mobile and in-home broadband networks. In addition to showing network performance test results to the user, the app provides the test results to the FCC while protecting the privacy and confidentiality of program volunteers. To close the gap between digital haves and have-nots, we are working to build a comprehensive, user-friendly dataset on broadband availability. Expanding the base of consumers who use the FCC's speed test app will enable us to provide improved coverage information to the public and to add to the measurement tools we're developing to show where broadband is truly available throughout the United States, said Acting Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel. The network coverage and performance information gathered from the speed test data will help to inform the FCC's efforts to collect more accurate and granular broadband deployment data. The network coverage and performance information gathered from the speed test data will help to inform the FCC's efforts to collect more accurate and granular broadband deployment data. The app will also be used in the future for consumers to challenge provider-submitted maps when the broadband data collection systems become available. You can test the performance of your mobile and in-home broadband networks by downloading the FCC's speed test application on your mobile devices. In addition to showing your network performance test results, the app also provides the test results back to the FCC as part of their Measuring Broadband America program. The program gathers crowdsourced data on broadband network performance across the United States. The information collected through the app will help to inform the FCC's efforts to provide improved coverage information to the public. We expect that some of the information collected through the app will be incorporated into the Commission's broadband data collection systems, including challenges to provider-submitted maps and our collection of additional crowdsourced data. As these new capabilities become available, app users may be asked to update or reinstall a new version of the app and to provide additional information and consents that will allow us to collect more precise speed test and location data for potential users in developing our public maps. 
The FCC speed test app is available in the Google Play Store for Android devices and in the Apple App Store for iOS devices. Search FCC speed test in either store to find and download the app. More information about the app is available on the FCC website. The National Hurricane Conference will take place June 14th through the 17th in New Orleans, Louisiana. The primary goal of the National Hurricane Conference is to improve hurricane preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation in the United States, the Caribbean Basin, and the Pacific. The event will be held at the Hilton New Orleans Riverside. The conference serves as a national forum for federal, state, and local officials to exchange ideas and recommend new policies to improve emergency management. FEMA and Emergency Management Institute training courses are offered as well as workshops and training sessions on a wide range of topics for hurricane responders. General session speakers will include many of the nation's top experts in hurricane-related issues. Radio amateurs involved in hurricane response are invited. Register online. The traditional amateur radio workshop is scheduled for Tuesday, June 16th from 1.30 till 5 p.m. Central Daylight Time and will be held virtually. Rob Macedo, KD1CY, the Director of Operations of the VOIP Hurricane Net, will moderate. The workshop will include Julio Rapol, WD4R, Assistant Coordinator of the National Hurricane Center's WX4NHC. Macedo has served as an emergency coordinator and district emergency coordinator and is currently section emergency coordinator for the AWRL Eastern Massachusetts section. He will focus on the National Weather Service and the Skywarn program and the relationship between Eastern Massachusetts Aries and the Massachusetts EMA and FEMA. Macedo has served as Skywarn coordinator for NWS Boston Norton since 1996. The 2021 Atlantic hurricane season begins on June 1st and runs through November 30th. The National Hurricane Center will start issuing regular tropical weather outlook reports on May 15th. The website E! News Channels reports that in celebration of World Radio Amateur Radio Day on April 18th, Maglite and ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, have announced they have formed a partnership based on the common mission of helping people be prepared for emergencies and to serve their communities in extreme situations such as natural disasters. ARRL member volunteers provide public service through the ARRL Amateur Radio Emergency Service and by expanding the reservoir of trained operators and technicians in radio communications and radio technology. MAG Instrument is the leading maker of U.S. manufactured high-quality flashlights that have a deserved reputation for performance, reliability, and durability. Amateur radio operators help people in times of difficulty, often by supporting emergency communications when critical infrastructure is damaged and by responding to the needs of first responders to keep connected, said Anthony Maglica, founder, owner, and CEO of MAG Instrument, Incorporated. We manufacture a product that has been used in public service for over 40 years, and we are very supportive of the incredible dedication of radio amateurs, so culturally this is a great alliance for both brands. Maglite is the preferred flashlight brand of many police, fire, and other first responder organizations, and is the official flashlight of the National Association of Search and Rescue. The partnership with ARRL will entail MAG Instrument creating special laser engraved MAGLite product for ARRL, as well as offering their members special pricing on a select line of MAGLite products, and in turn, those purchases raise funds for ARRL to support their mission. ARRL is delighted that MAGLite recognizes the service and skill of ARRL members. This partnership will help us introduce amateur radio to more people, said David Minster, NA2AA, ARRL CEO. ARRL, headquartered in Newington, Connecticut, counts the majority of active radio amateurs in the U.S. among its ranks. Since ARRL's founding in 1914, its members have advanced the art, science, and enjoyment of amateur radio. The ARRL Foundation Board of Directors has selected Elwood Woody Brem, 
K3YV of Spring Mill, Pennsylvania as the winner of the 2020 Bill Orr W6SAI Technical Writing Award for his article, Leaky Antenna Switches, which appeared in the March 2020 issue of QST. The Foundation Board acted on a recommendation from the QST editorial staff in selecting the recipient at its January 27th annual meeting. I'm truly honored, Brem said. Bill Orr was and is one of my inspirations. I've read his books for many years and have always tried to live up to his high standards. I'd like to thank Bill Orr helped me along with a wonderful career in electrical engineering. The Bill Orr W6SAI Technical Writing Award is bestowed every year on the author of an outstanding QSD article or a series on new and existing technologies or on methods or means of amateur communication. Articles must be written in an easily understood style worthy of the Bill Orr stamp of approval, encourage interest and expand knowledge and understanding of amateurs who may lack a strong technical background. The QST editorial staff serves as a selection panel and recommends the winner from a review of the year's QST articles. Established by ARRL in 1973, the ARRL Foundation is an independent IRS 501c3 organization that administers programs to support the amateur radio community. The ARRL Foundation advances the art, science, and societal benefits of amateur radio by awarding financial grants and scholarships to individuals and organizations in support of their charitable, educational, and scientific efforts. Ten more local BBC radio stations are turning off their medium wave transmitters for good this year. BBC Essex, Cambridgeshire, Devon, Leeds, Sheffield, Hereford and Worcester, Stoke, Lancashire, Ulster and BBC Radio Foil will go to FM and digital only in May and June 2021. In addition, BBC Radio Wales and BBC Radio Gloucestershire will reduce their AM coverage. The BBC's intention to close medium wave transmitters was first announced 10 years ago in 2011. In 2018, the corporation commenced with these plans and continued them in 2020 across Scotland, Wales and England. Kieran Clifton, the Director of BBC Distribution and Business Development, said that a large and increasing share of radio listening in the UK, including to the BBC, is digital, and the BBC is committed to a digital future for radio. In recent years, we've made significant investment in local DAB expansion, he said. All of our local radio stations are available on digital terrestrial TV, such as Freeview, and we've transformed our online and mobile offering with the app BBC Sounds. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I felt, I don't know, what are you, how, how are you feeling these days? I feel, now I'm in an unusual situation because I overshare already. I'm on the air talking to people five days a week, four days a week. So by the time I get home, I feel like anything that anybody wants to know about me is already out there. So I don't use Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and social networks like that, probably in the way a normal person would to let people know what I'm up to and to promote stuff. Uh, it just, uh, I don't, I don't feel the need. It's the same reason I got my ham license, you know, my amateur radio license. I was very excited. I really enjoyed it. I took the test, got the, the general license and got all the equipment and stuff. And then I never use it because I realized, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm already talking to people <laughs> for my work all day, every day. And the last thing I want to do, I know there are people, I know Art Bell, Art Bell, he'll do his, he used to do his radio show, get off the air and then go on uh, and, and, and talk to hams for two more hours. I just want to go home and watch TV. <laughs> I just want to shut up. You know how much energy a simple Google search uses? We don't think of it. We don't really think of that, do we? I mean, we don't, we don't go, oh, wow, I got to cut back on my Google, <laughs> my Googling. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta slow down on my googling because it's using up a single, according to, well, the UK's independent fact-checking charity, fullfact.org, a Google search, and this is Google's own estimate, a Google search, each and every one, and how many trillions of searches a day, right? Each and every one could power a ten-watt light bulb for one hundred eight seconds. <laughs> Just 108 seconds. So if you see you see an overestimate somewhere, that's his Google zone. That's a 60, uh, equivalent of a 60-watt LED bulb. It's a 10-watt. So an LED bulb 
for 108 seconds. Okay, you might say, okay, that's pretty trivial. It's not, though. Add that up. How many searches a second go through Google? That's that's the issue. The point I, the only point I'm making here is that we don't think about the cloud using energy, but it does. It uses a ton of energy, and we're using it all the time. Every time you go on the net, every website you visit, every search you make, when you go you know, to Google and you type in a search term, it's as if these machines are going... Think about what it's got to go through. Billions and billions of bytes of data looking for that one little thing. You know, who won the Super Bowl in 2019? You go... And it's, it spins up energy. And these companies, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, because of this, when they build their big network operation centers, which are just giant buildings, giant tilt-up buildings with thousands of computers inside. They're just little, they're called rack mount because they can, they can, they don't stand on a desk. They sit in a rack and they're lined up and they're rack mount computers, thousands of them, row upon row of blinky lights, all connected by wires. And it's not just the computers. Those things use energy. You know, they heat up. Oh, they heat up. That's another problem. You got to have a lot of air conditioning in there to keep the, I mean, imagine if you put 10,000 computers in a, in a small, you know, in a 10,000 square foot space, how hot it would get in there. So you've got to have giant air conditioning. So a lot of power used up by these network operation centers. And then, and not to mention all the switches and all the networking stuff. And then, you know, you got to pay for that power. So companies tend to build their network operation centers in places where power is cheap and cooling is available, which often means near hydroelectric facilities uh, up in Oregon where it's cooler uh, and, and they have a cheap power northern virginia for some reason that's a big nova is a big area where a lot of north carolina too it's a, it so they they're actually out there trying to find places where we can run these network operation centers cheap and and if you think about it when you do a google search it's not just one network operations center they're all over the place they're all over the world in fact some of these companies have so much computing power on the line that they'll just rent out the excess from time to time that's how that's actually how the first online services start you may remember if you're an old timer that's funny i always know when somebody's been computing for a long time if they're an old timer if i say what's your copy serve id and they go oh seven five one oh six comma three one three five that's that was mine if you remember your compu well compu serve came about because h and r block the big tax firm had lots of computers to do taxes, but they noticed they weren't real busy. <laughs> April 16th, it got a little quiet. And they said, we should do something. We've got all these computers. We don't really can't really shut them down. They're they're churning along. We should do something. So they started an online service called CompuServe. General Electric did the same thing. They called it Genie. There's no excuse for America Online. That's just <laughs> that just that just happened. So this is, the, and that's what Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple uh, all do. They, they lease out computing power. Google has the Google Compute Engine and the Elastic Cloud, or is that Amazon? I think Amazon's the Elastic Cloud. Uh, they have AWS, Amazon Web Services. Turns out they make more money on AWS than they do on selling stuff to you. Did you know that? Amazon, in order to be Amazon, had to put all these computers together, build these network operations centers. They also had to build uh, fulfillment centers, right? Big warehouses all over the country where your stuff is so that they can ship it out to you. And uh, Jeff Bezos, you don't get to be the richest man in the world without a little bit of smarts, right? He said, hmm, we got all this excess capacity, both in fulfillment centers and in computing. What can we do with it? They created Amazon Web Services, many billions of dollars a year in revenue. It's very profitable for them. For storage, for computing. If you go to a website, most of your websites, most of the places you go are not... You know, if you go to uh, the Washington Post, it's not some computer in Washington, D.C. No, it's an Amazon server, Amazon Web Services server somewhere else. AWS is even my website. If you go to techguylabs.com or our podcast site, twit.tv, those are running on Amazon Web Services. Everybody does. Why would you want to do anything else? Amazon got, it's cheap. It's got all this extra stuff. And then they had all these fulfillment centers. What else did they do? Well, about half of all the stuff you buy from Amazon now isn't from Amazon, you're buying it from a third party that is using Amazon's facilities to store and ship their stuff. It's actually been an amazing success, not just for Amazon, but just for our economy, because it's a lot easier to start a business. Whether you're going to be a, a software startup, a website, maybe you're going to sell stuff out of your house, 
you don't have to have a fulfillment center. You don't have to have shipping. You just say, okay, Amazon, you handle it. I'll send you the order, you handle it. And you, you make your little profit. Some of it goes to Amazon. Same thing with computing. If you're a startup, I don't want to have to run a server. I don't, you know, so you can do it on Amazon or, or you know, Microsoft does this, Google does this. A lot of companies do it now with their excess server capacity. It's kind of interesting. It's really kind of powered this modern uh, technology age. We don't think about it. It's it's infrastructure. It's it's the cloud. It's out there. But uh, no, it's the cloud. When you do a Google search, many dozens of computers wake up and say, hello. They pull down enough power to power a 10 watt bulb for 108 seconds and they give you the answer. And boy, do they give you the answer fast. Think about that. We just take this by, for granted now. But if I type in who won the Super Bowl in 2019, I don't even have to type it. I can just I can ask Siri who won the Super Bowl in 2019. Beat the Rams in the Super Bowl by a score of 13 to 3 on February 3rd, 2019. That was less than one second to get that answer. And 108 minutes, no, seconds of light bulb power. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? We really take that for granted. There is a whole bunch of stuff and it's happening invisibly behind the scenes. Pretty cool, I think. We live in interesting times, don't we? Uh, let's see, what else is uh, in the news? Boy, you know, I've been doing... Uh, I've been doing this show since the early 90s. And uh, at that time, when I started doing it, you couldn't say technology was all around us. I mean, people had computers on their desks, but internet usage wasn't widespread. In fact, hardly anybody used it. Email, uh, when I first started this, didn't even go uh, from one person to another. You, you had to all be on the same platform. You remember MCI mail? You could only email... It was electronic mail. You could only email other people with MCI mail or Genie or CompuServe or AOL. You could only email AOL people, right? And then a few years later, all of a sudden, the Internet, and you could email anybody anywhere. That's when the changes started. The big change, I guess, 2007, about 15 years after I started. Is that right? Yeah. 15 years after I started uh, doing this show. That can't be right. Yeah, it is. So. Uh, <laughs> then uh, that's when the iPhone came out and everything changed because all of a sudden you had the internet in your pocket. You were always, always on, always connected. Man, man, now we're now we're in the world of TikTok and Snapchat and Twitter and Facebook and the Goog. It's really changed, but that's part of the fun for me, at least. It's not boring. It never stops, and of course, it means you need me even more. I'm here if you need me. <laughs> I'm your tech guy. This week, the president met with uh, executives from many of the big tech companies, as well as the CEOs of Ford and General Motors, to address the ongoing chip shortage. Both Ford and GM have had to slow down lines producing cars and trucks because they couldn't get the special automotive chips now that everything's got a chip in it. <sighs> uh, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger, who was was there, said... It's going to be a couple of years before we get our new plants up uh, online in Arizona. They're going to spend $50 billion. I'm sorry, $20 billion to do that. The president is, is chipping in. Get it? Uh -uh. $50 billion for a chip production infrastructure plan. It's a crisis, but the problem is the solution to the crisis isn't short term. You can't just automatically wave a wand and make more chips appear. You've got to build factories. And many of those factories, good news, will be built in, in the U.S., which I think is prudent, especially if we're putting the money in, right? So 2023, maybe, before this stuff eases up. Yikes. TSMC, which is a big Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company, that's what TSMC stands for, is uh, ponying up $100 billion over the next few years to build plants, including... A $12 billion chip fab, that's what they call these fabrication and assembly plants, a chip fab in Arizona. Yay. You know, there's a couple things going on here. Concern about tariffs, but more importantly, concern about the geopolitical situation with China, even with regards to Taiwan. It's uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't want to be completely reliant on manufacturing in China, which most tech companies, in fact, most companies, period, are in the U.S. and around the world. So this is a long-term plan that ain't going to give us any short-term relief. It's not just uh, COVID, by the way. It's natural disasters. There have been a number of fires, three as, as far as I remember, in chip factories, which have really reduced production. 
It's also, we want more chips. <laughs> We're eating them up like crazy. Was it Lay's potato chips who said, you know, eat as many as you want, we'll make more? It ain't that way with microprocessing chips. They're hard to make. They're expensive to make. And the planning happens years before. So they planned a certain amount. With COVID, everybody, you know, computer sales were up. Tablet sales were up. Even cellular, you know, smartphones were up. Cars started using chips. A lot of devices that didn't use chips before started using chips. Suddenly the demand is exponential and everybody was caught a little off guard. So it's going to be a couple of years before that eases up. A couple of years. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. World War II started on September 1, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. By May 1940, Germany had conquered much of Europe and had her sights on Britain. Although the United States was officially neutral, it was obvious that our sympathies were with the Allies. In addition, it was clear to a few prospective Americans that we would be drawn into the conflict. Amateur radio operators, like most Americans, began to gear up for war. On June 4, 1940, the FCC issued Order No. 72, which prohibited amateurs from engaging in foreign communications or from establishing contact with any or all points outside the continental U.S. and its possessions. The FCC was quite serious about this. They revoked the licenses of several hams who had contact with foreign stations. The How's DX column was jokingly called, Where's DX? So many foreign hams, including our neighbors in Canada, had been off the air since September 1939. Throughout 1940 and 1941, the face of amateur radio changed with the darkening war cloud. The War Department sent out a questionnaire to all hams to obtain data on equipment, experience, physical fitness, and availability for service. Columns devoted to the military began to appear, such as Army Amateur Radio System Activities, which included the schedule of station WAR on 4025 and 6990 kilocycles. Other columns were Naval Communication Reserve Notes, In the Services, which listed amateurs now in military service, and USA Calling, which published requests from the Navy, Marines, Army, Army Air Corps, Signal Corps, and Merchant Marine, and even the FBI, for amateurs proficient as radio operators, electronic specialists, electrical engineers, and communications officers. In the summer of 1940, the British used the USA Calling column to issue an urgent appeal for radio servicemen and amateurs for their civilian technical corps. Up to 25,000 Americans were requested by the British. Foreign espionage invaded the ham bands in 1940. The FBI, in a successful bid to capture several foreign agents in the U.S., operated a counter-espionage station in the 20-meter band. Using a phony amateur call, the FBI passed over 500 messages to various spies before arresting them. Amateurs were members of the Defense Communication Board, which met every week to prepare for a military emergency. Amateurs also made their own preparations for a national emergency. QST ran several editorials urging hams to improve their CW skills. Many articles appeared on emergency equipment such as vibrator power supplies to supply the B-plus voltage for tubes, battery-operated radios, and mobile stations. The 2.5 meter band, which ran from 112 to 116 megacycles, was chosen as the primary civil defense band, and every issue of QST had another 2.5 meter construction project including a few walkie-talkies. Civil defense coordination and participation was urged. On July 22, 1941, the FCC, in response to the national emergency, announced that the 3650 to 3950 kilocycle portion of 80 meters would be withdrawn from amateur use and reassigned to the military for use as an aircraft pilot training program. Amateurs were given a few months to vacate the band, and preparations were made to move popular 80-meter nets to 160. 
But before the reassignment was completed in December 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked. On December 8, 1941, the FCC issued Order No. 87, which read in part, Whereas a state of war exists between the United States and the Imperial Japanese government, and the withdrawal from private use of all amateur frequencies is required for the purpose of national defense, it is ordered that except as may hereafter be specifically authorized by the Commission, no person shall engage in any amateur radio operation, and all frequencies heretofore allocated to amateur radio stations under Part 12 of the Rules and Regulations are hereby withdrawn. All amateur licenses are hereby notified that the Commission has ordered the immediate suspension of all amateur radio operation in the continental U.S., its territories, and possessions. However, the FCC left a small loophole for amateur operation during the war. Amateurs would be allowed to operate for the purpose of national defense upon application of a federal, state, or local official. In our next installment, we will look at some amateur operations during World War II. Some will surprise you. The Swiss National Amateur Radio Society, USKA, is looking for people willing to be mentors to help newcomers to amateur radio. The USKA said that on a regular basis, people interested in our passionate hobby, our varied activities and communities, got in touch with them. The USKA wants to advise these potential newcomers from the beginning, explain amateur radio and the fantastic possibilities, and to accompany them in their amateur radio career. And to that end, the USKA is currently organising a mentoring system. The task of a mentor is to support an interested person, possibly over a long period. This includes a warm welcome, explanation of interests and objectives, and supporting the activities that are taking place. Mentoring activities are varied and depend on the requirements of the individual, but might include advice by phone, by Skype or by vision conference, and hopefully soon by personal meetings too. A startup meeting to discuss specific interests, an introduction to amateur radio, and what does this term cover today, with supplementary information sources on the web. Long-term support leading up to success in the novice amateur radio exam, and to act as a contact person for questions regarding the preparation for this exam. It might include assisting as an instructor and helping with demonstrations, participation in competitions and conferences, and helping with the administration of free or cheap equipment for beginners. So, might you be someone who's willing to give their time in the best ham radio spirit to guide people of all ages in amateur radio and help them to acquire a license? Well, if so, please contact the USKA Youth Training and Promotion Officer, Vili Hotel Bravo 9 Alpha Mike Charlie. You can find out how to apply at tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Switzerland. Researchers in the United States who have been working with atom-based sensors and receivers, say their work holds potential for weeding out environmental noise and other radio interference. Scientists at the National Institute of Standards and Technology see the sensor as a vital component because of its ability to measure what they call the angle of arrival of a wireless signal, a capability that they believe will have a positive impact on transmissions for radar, 5G, and other modes. According to an article in phys.org, the system is able to take incoming signals and convert them to different frequencies. After measuring the separate electromagnetic waves frequencies and their phase, that is, the position of the waves relative to each other, the system can determine where the signal is coming from. The scientists say that's necessary in order to differentiate real communications from interfering signals. According to the phys.org article, atom-based radio receivers and antennas have other added benefits. They can be a great deal smaller than their traditional counterparts and, by making use of atoms to do the main work, have no need for more conventional forms of electronics to do signal conversion. The Red Cross Emergency Communication Training Group is holding its nationwide spring drill on World Red Cross Day, May 8th. Individuals are invited to participate. In February 2020, an organizing phone call was held with a dozen Red Cross-affiliated radio amateurs to consider creating a nationwide radio drill. By May, the group had more than 100 people on the team calls and more than 1,000 participated in that first spring drill. Synthesizing lessons learned from the first event, the managing group simplified and narrowed the focus for a fall drill last November, choosing to concentrate on wind link involvement. 
Red Cross forms are built in as templates in WinLink Express, and hams using WinLink can also send messages to non-hams. The group's goal for the fall drill was to attract as many hams as possible using WinLink at a basic level. Over 1,700 participated from over 40 states and a few foreign countries. For next month's Spring 21 drill, the goal is the same, but now the bar will be raised in WinLink proficiency and, being World Red Cross Day, more international participation will be solicited. The group has been holding regular WinLink training sessions with the last one occurring April 8th. WinLink Thursdays have been attracting over 500 participants. Foundations of Amateur Radio if you've been around radio amateurs for a little while, you're likely to have heard about the solar cycle and that it affects radio propagation for HF, or high frequency, also known as shortwave communications. The frequency is in the range of around 3 to 30 megahertz, or 100 meters to 10 meters wavelength. One of the main ways it's used is for long distance or global communication, and one of the most common ways that's done is using the ionosphere around the globe to refract a radio signal. In September 2020, the Solar Cycle 25 Prediction Panel announced that Solar Cycle 25 had commenced in December 2019, and radio amateurs around the globe rejoiced. The first question for me was, why Solar Cycle 25? You might think of the sun as a stable light in the sky. As it happens, the bright light hides all manner of ferocious activity. One of the measures of this activity is the number of dots observed on the surface of our star. These dots are called sunspots. As solar activity increases, the number of sunspots increases. The activity is cyclical. It increases and decreases over time. Each increase and decrease combined is known as a solar cycle. On average, a cycle lasts about 10.7 years. Simple maths gives you that solar cycles started somewhere around 1750. That seems a little strange. Our sun is 4.6 billion years old. There are paintings on the rocks at Ubir in the Northern Territory of Australia that are 40,000 years old. The pyramids in Egypt are 4,500 years old. The solar cycle has been going for a lot longer than the 7 million years there have been humans on the planet, let alone dinosaurs who experienced the solar cycle 66 million years ago. Using fossil records, we've determined that the solar cycle has been stable for at least the last 700 million years. Chinese astronomers recorded solar activity around 800 BC and Chinese and Korean astronomers frequently observed sunspots, but no known drawings exist of these observations. The first person to draw sunspots was John of Worcester on the 8th of December 1128. Five days later, half a world away, in Korea on the 13th of December 1128, the astronomers in Songdo reported a red vapour that, quote, soared and filled the sky. End quote, describing the aurora borealis in the night sky that resulted from those very same sunspots. In the early 1600s, there was plenty of activity around the recording of sunspots. Thomas Harriot appears to have predated Galileo Galilei by more than a year, with notes and drawings dated the 8th of December 1610. There's plenty of other names during this period father and son David and Johannes Fabricius, and Christoph Scheiner, to name three. But I'm moving on. The solar cycle was first described by Christian Horobo, who more than a century later in 1775 wrote, quote, It appears that after the course of a certain number of years, the appearance of the sun repeats itself with respect to the number and size of the spots, end quote. Recognition of the solar cycle was awarded to Samuel Heinrich Schwab, who noticed the regular variation in the number of sunspots, and published his findings in a short article entitled Solar Observations During 1843, in which he suggested that the cycle was 10 years. Stay with me, we're getting close to solar cycle number one. In 1848, Rudolf Wolf devised a way to quantify sunspot activity. His method, named the Wolf number, is still in use today, though we call it the Relative or International Sunspot Number. 
In 1852, he published his findings on all the available data on sunspot activity, going back to 1610, and calculated the average solar cycle duration as 11.11 .11 years. He didn't have enough observations to reliably identify solar cycles before 1755, so the 1755 to 1766 solar cycle is what we now consider solar cycle number one, lasting 11.3 years with a maximum of 144.1 sunspots in June of 1761. Until 2009, it was thought that there had been 28 solar cycles between 1699 and 2008, with an average duration of 11.04 years. But it appears that the 15-year solar cycle between 1784 and 1799 was actually two cycles, making the average length only 10.7 years. I should also point out that there have been solar cycles as short as 8 years and as long as 14 years. With the announcement of Solar Cycle 25 comes improved propagation for anyone who cares to get on air and make noise. The current predictions vary depending on the method used, ranging from a very weak to a moderate Solar Cycle 25. There are predictions for the solar maximum, the time with the most sunspot activity, to occur between 2023 and 2026, with a sunspot range between 95 and 130. By comparison, during the previous solar cycle, in 2011 the first peak hit 99, and the second peak in 2014 hit 101. I have purposely stayed away from electromagnetic fields, geomagnetic impacts and the actual methods for HF propagation. I'll look at those another time. I can tell you that we've gone a little beyond counting dots on the Sun to determine activity, and we have a whole slew of satellites orbiting our star doing all manner of scientific discovery, all of which helps our understanding of what's going on in the massive physics phenomenon 8 minutes and 20 seconds away by radio. That said, solar eruptions are still pretty unpredictable, much like the weather around us. Not because we don't want to know, but because this is a very complex one to solve. Much like ionospheric propagation is hard to forecast. Much easier to measure actual performance, and much more accurate. So, if you want to know how well propagation is going to be today, turn on your radio and have a listen. If you want to know how great it's going to be tomorrow, Look at the forecast, but bring an umbrella, or an FT8 transmitter. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. On Saturday the 24th of April 2021, Norfolk's radio amateurs will once again contact other enthusiasts around the world with the call sign Golf Bravo Zero, Charlie Mike Sierra, as part of the International Marconi Day celebrations. But this year is different due to COVID restrictions. Operators will work from their home locations on a rotor basis. Ten operators will share the operating time from midnight to midnight and plan to be on 160 metres to 10 metres using CW, single sideband, FT4 and FT8. The Norfolk Amateur Radio Club usually runs an all-day special event station with this call sign GB0 Charlie Mike Sierra at Caister Lifeboat Visitor Centre to commemorate the village's original Marconi wireless station, which was established at Caister in 1900. The station was in a house in the High Street, known as Pretoria Villa, and its original purpose was to communicate with ships in the North Sea and the Cross Sands Lightship. On Saturday, the closest to Marconi's birthday, stations around the world are set up at sites with historical links to the inventor's work. These include Poldhu in England, Cape Cod in Massachusetts, Glace Bay, Nova Scotia, Villa Griffone in Bologna, Italy, and many others. Activations closer to home here in the UK include Marconi stations in Holyhead, Daventry, and The Lizard in Cornwall, home to some of the inventor's early work. Any radio amateur making contact with GB0 CMS can request a special QSL card with a historic photograph of the original Caister Marconi wireless station on the front. Norfolk Amateur Radio Club Public Relations Officer Steve Nichols, who's organising the event, said, It's a shame that we can't be back at Caister Lifeboat, but this seems like a good alternative. We will aim to make contact with as many amateurs as possible, and as we'll be operating for more hours than usual, I have no doubt that we might break our record for the number of contacts.
Steve suggests keeping an eye on the DX clusters to find out in real time when GB0 CMS is operating. One of the DX clusters can be found at new.dxsummit.fi. That's new.dxsummit.fi. The Federal Communications Commission has announced that rule changes detailed in a lengthy 2019 report and order governing RF exposure standards go into effect on May 3, 2021. With more on these modified requirements for amateurs, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. The new rules don't change existing RF exposure or RFE limits, but do require that stations be evaluated against existing limits unless exempt. For stations already in place, that evaluation must be completed by May 3rd, 2023. After May 3rd of this year, any new station or any existing station modified in a way that's likely to change its RFE profile, such as different antennas or placement or greater power, will need to conduct an evaluation by the date of activation or change. The FCC anticipates that few hams would have to reevaluate their stations under the new rules. The amateur service is no longer categorically excluded from certain aspects of the rules as amended, and licensees can no longer avoid performing an exposure assessment simply because they're transmitting below a given power level. The 2019 FCC RF report and order changes the methods that many radio services use to comply with FCC RFE limits. HAMS will have to determine whether any existing facilities excluded under the old rules now qualify for an exemption under the new rules. Most will, but some may not. Removal of the categorical exclusion means that HAMS must perform some sort of calculation, either to determine if they qualify for an exemption or have to perform a full-fledged exposure assessment. ARRL has help at www.arrl.org forward slash RF hyphen exposure. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. In the RF report and order, the Commission anticipated that few parties would have to conduct re-evaluations under the new rules and that such evaluations will be relatively straightforward, the FCC said in an April 2nd public notice. It nevertheless adopted a two-year period for parties to verify and ensure compliance under the new rules. For most amateurs, the major difference is the removal of the categorical exclusion for amateur radio, which means that ham station owners must determine if they either qualify for an exemption or must perform a routine environmental evaluation, said Greg Lapin, N9GL, chair of the ARRL RF Safety Committee and a member of the FCC Technological Advisory Council. Ham stations previously excluded from performing environmental evaluations will have until May 3, 2023 to perform these. After May 3, 2021, any new stations or those modified in a way that affects RF exposure must comply before being put into service, Lapin said. The FCC also modified the process for determining whether a particular device or deployment is exempt from a more thorough analysis by replacing a service-specific list of transmitters, facilities, and operations for which evaluation is required with new streamlined formula-based criteria. The report and order also addressed how to perform evaluations where the exemption does not apply and how to mitigate exposure. Amateur radio licensees will have to determine whether any existing facilities previously excluded under the old rules now qualify for an exemption under the new rules. Most will, but some may not. For amateurs, the major difference is the removal of the categorical exclusion, Lapin said, which means that every ham will be required to perform some sort of calculation either to determine if they qualify for an exemption or must perform a full-fledged exposure assessment. For hams who previously performed exposure assessments on their stations, 
There is nothing more to do. The ARRL laboratory staff is available to help amateurs to make these determinations and, if needed, perform the necessary calculations to ensure their stations comply. ARRL laboratory manager Ed Hare, W1RFI, who helped prepare ARRL's RF Exposure and U book, explained it this way. The FCC did not change any of the underlying rules applicable to amateur station evaluations, he said. The sections of the book on how to perform routine station evaluations are still valid and usable, especially the many charts of common antennas at different heights. Hare said ARRL lab staff also would be available to help amateurs understand the rules and evaluate their stations. RF Exposure and U is available for free download from ARRL. ARRL also has an RF safety page on its website. The ARRL RF Safety Committee is working with the FCC to update the FCC aids for following human exposure rules, OET Bulletin 65 and OET Bulletin 65 Supplement B for radio amateurs. In addition, ARRL is developing tools that all hams can use to perform exposure assessments. Time now for the AMSAT report. Smog 1 from the Budapest University of Technology and Economics has earned its Oscar number. It's now Magyar Oscar 110 or MO110. Here's an update to last week's information about TO108 or CAS6. It was originally turned on for amateur use in June of last year. For those who've tried using it, though, you'll know that it would be on for two seconds and off for five. That makes for a difficult contact. It was discovered on April 12th that it's now staying on for several minutes at a time. Several operators have confirmed this, and it remains intermittently operational, with contacts much more possible now. CAMSAT has applied for frequency coordination for CAS-9 launches planned for December 15th. Jim, ND-9M, is aboard a merchant marine ship and is giving out many, many wet grids. The ship passed through the Panama Canal earlier this week and is headed west. Jim is on during the early afternoon and again in the evening. Bruce has worked him on the evening passes of RS-44 just above the center of the passband using CW. Jim also works some of the FM satellites during the early afternoon and most of the linear satellites when he's not working. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. The British Virgin Islands Department of Disaster Management reports that the Territory's emergency communications capabilities have been strengthened by the addition of two new licensed amateur radio operators, including one who has achieved the rank of examiner. Elton, November Papa 2 Tango Uniform, is the BVI's first amateur radio operator to qualify as a volunteer examiner and the first to earn this accreditation remotely. He initially trained in emergency radio operations as a volunteer under the late Arthur Swain, professional cadet at the Department of Disaster Management. Keon, Victor Papa 2, Victor Kilo Alpha, also becomes the first British Virgin Islands amateur radio operator to earn an operating license remotely. Department of Disaster Management Acting Director Jason Penn said that licensed amateur radio operators are an important component of emergency communications. He said, Amateur radio operators are a community that shares information about local conditions around the region and the world, and they can communicate even when landline or mobile services become inoperable. And he added, this means they help us all to prepare for and respond to threats from weather and other disasters. The BVI amateur radio operators also connected on Sunday, April the 18th for World Amateur Radio Day, which was observed this year under the theme Home But Never Alone. This theme was chosen to reflect amateur radio's ability to connect persons who may otherwise feel isolated due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Interested parties in the British Virgin Islands who would like to pursue their licence are encouraged to contact the BVI Amateur Radio League President, Dr Ronald Georges, Victor Papa 2, Victor Alpha Oscar. It's time for this week's propagation forecast. 
Frank Donovan, W3LPL, says the long-anticipated significant increase in Solar Cycle 25 activity may have begun back on April 19th. As a result, 30 and 20 meter nighttime propagation and 17 and 15 meter daytime propagation is likely to be enhanced through at least April 26th. The solar flux index is likely to remain at 85 or higher through at least April 26th due to two active regions on the sun's surface, numbers 2816 and 2817, containing 16 sunspots in all. Two additional active solar regions on the far side of the sun are expected to rotate into view later this week, possibly increasing the solar flux index and extending enhanced propagation at least through late April. You can look at Donovan's article, What to Expect During the Rising Years of Solar Cycle 25, in the May 2021 issue of QST. Meanwhile, Chad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that four new sunspots emerged this week and were visible every single day. Spaceweather.com issued a warning on April 26th of a coronal mass ejection that is headed for Earth, and it could spark a geomagnetic storm when it arrives on April 25th. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration forecasters say moderately strong G2-class storms are possible, which means auroras could dip into northern-tier U.S. states from Maine to Washington. The average daily sunspot number surged from 7 to 35.1, while the average daily solar flux increased from 75 to 78. Due to seemingly constant solar wind, average planetary A indices rose from 5.1 to 16.4, and average daily middle latitude A indices went from 4.1 to 13. Looking ahead, the predicted solar flux is 84 on April 23rd through the 24th, 82 on April 25th through the 27th, 80 on April 28th, 78 on April 29th through the 30th, 78 on May 1st and 2nd, and 78 on May 3rd, and 72 on May 4th and 9th. The predicted planetary A indice is 10, 8, 25, and 12 on April 23rd through the 26th, 5 on April 27th through May 3rd, 15 on May 4th, 5 on May 5th through the 7th, 8 on May 8th, and 5 on May 9th through the 10th. The American Radio Relay League, the ARRL, reports that the Huntington Library in San Marino, California, has acquired an archive of papers and correspondence to, from, and about wireless pioneer and Nobel laureate Guillermo Marconi. Among the more than 200 pages of correspondence are 31 letters from Marconi to his chief engineer, Richard Vivian, written between 1902 and 1909, regarding the construction and successful implementation of a transatlantic telegraph system. The collection also includes Vivian's extensive manuscript overview of wireless technology. It's called Notes on Long Distance Wireless Telegraphy and the Design and Construction and Working of High Power Wireless Stations, which was written between 1900 and 1904. Marconi transformed the speed and effectiveness of telecommunications through wireless telegraphy. So said Daniel Lewis, who is responsible for the Huntingdon's History of Science and Technology holdings from 1800 to the present day. Marconi was relentless in his attempts to improve on his radio work, as reflected in this archive. Writing to his chief engineer, Marconi said, I'm working very hard to try and find out what are the somewhat occult causes which make signals good one night and unobtainable the next. He wrote to Vivian in 1907, I believe I found, if not very clearly, the cause of the effects noticed. Vivian was largely responsible for the construction and operation of the transmitting station at Poldu in Cornwall, from where the first ever transatlantic signal was sent to Newfoundland on December 12, 1901. He was also in charge of the Cape Breton station the following year, when the first signal was sent in the opposite direction, and a regular transatlantic telegraph service was established. The Huntingdon collection of telegraph-related holdings is one of the most significant in the United States. It began with a 2002 donation of several boxes of correspondence to and from Marconi. In the UK, there is the Marconi Collection in Oxford. In 2004, the Marconi Collection was presented to the University of Oxford by the Marconi Corporation. This large and unrivaled archive of objects and documents records the work of Marconi and the wireless telegraph company he founded. The documents are kept in the Bodleian Library and the objects in the Museum of History of Science, Oxford.
The Yasme Foundation has released two chronicles of amateur radio DX history that make for some compelling reading. To tell us more about the chronicles and how you can read them, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME at League Headquarters with more. A downloadable edition of Yasme, the Danny Weil and Colvin Radio Expeditions by Jim Kane, K1TN, and the extended article, Danny Weil, a dreamer of distant lands who took the amateur radio trip of a lifetime by Marty Lane, OH2BH. Kane's 324-page history, initially published by ARRL in 2003 and now out of print, is available for the first time in a downloadable format at no cost. It includes some as-originally-intended revisions to the text, as well as a new introduction. Kane's book documents the lives and DX adventures of Danny Weil, VP2VB, of Yasme fame, and of Iris and Lloyd Colvin, W6QL and W6KG, respectively. It also offers a look into the DXCC program from the 1950s through 2000. Between 1955 and 1963, Danny Weil sailed to various exotic locations in his yawl to operate, escaping dangerous and life-threatening disasters along the way. In 1964, the Colvins took up the Yasme banner, visiting 223 countries and operating for more than half of them before their final expedition in 1993. Yasme Foundation President Ward Silver and Zero AX said Kane's book, along with recounting some fascinating history, explains a lot about how the structures of modern DXing emerged, introducing many of us to the colorful characters who populated the DX scene at the time. Visit the Yasme website, www.yasme, that's Y-A-S-M-E, dot O-R-G, to access these fascinating histories. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Even after years of writing a DX newsletter and then publishing dozens of feature articles in QST, I guess I hadn't got it out of my system yet, Kane said, recounting the book offer that was too good to pass up. I had a lot of words and entire sentences left in me. Another ham radio legend, Dick Spensley, KV4AA, created the Yasme Foundation to provide funding for Wiles' excursions. He also prompted Wiles' fundraising tour in 1956 to more than 100 ham radio clubs and gatherings. At one point, Bill Halligan, W9AC of Helicrafters fame, offered Wile $2,000 worth of gear with the stipulation that he not use any other manufacturer's equipment. Wile's wife, Naomi, accompanied him on some of his maritime journeys to rare DX venues. Lane's article provides even more details about the life of Danny Weil and his de-expeditions, drawing from Wile's personal recollections as well as Kane's book. The article's webpage includes links to a collection of Wiles' QSL cards and an audio interview of Wiles at age 80 by Wolf Herenth, OE1WHC of Dokenfunk. The Yasme Foundation, first established to support the DX adventures of Wiles and then Calvin's, today supports various projects related to amateur radio, with an emphasis on its development in emerging countries and encouraging youth participation. News just in from Philip Delta Kilo 6 Sierra Papa and Marcus Delta Lima 8 Gulf Mike of the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Youth Working Group. They're sad to announce the following news. The Youth on the Air Summer Camp in Croatia, which had already been postponed to 2021 from last year, has had to be postponed again to 2022 due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. This difficult decision was made together with officials from HRS, the Croatian Amateur Radio Society, following the IARU Region 1 wide COVID-19 event cancellation policy. The IARU Region 1 Secretary has been informed about this decision. The Youth Working Group will keep everyone updated on any news regarding upcoming in-person events. They say, stay safe around the world and we hope to see you again in 2022. The IARU Region 1 COVID-19 event cancellation policy can be found under this story on the Southgate Amateur Radio Club news website at www.southgatearc.org. 
the long-awaited Youth on the Air Camp for Young Amateur Radio Operators in North, Central, and South America will go forward this July. With more details on the upcoming Youth on the Air Summer Camp, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. The camp is set for July 11th through the 16th at the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting in Westchester Township, Ohio. The camp had to be postponed in 2020 due to the coronavirus pandemic. The ARRL Foundation is a contributing donor for 2021 Yoda Camp. Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, says the camp will comply with COVID-19 restrictions and guidelines as set by the state of Ohio and the Centers for Disease Control. Attendees may need to take a COVID-19 test and or self-quarantine prior to arrival. Rapp said that if the COVID-19 situation unexpectedly goes downhill, the event could be postponed again until 2022. 28 campers from the U.S., Canada, Mexico, and Iceland have already signed up for the 30 open slots, but Youth on the Air will continue to accept applications through June 1st. It costs nothing to apply. The camp's $100 fee is not due until the applicant has been accepted. Potential campers who cannot afford the fee may apply for a scholarship. The Youth on the Air website has camp details at Youth on the air, all one word, dot org, forward slash camps. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The entire staff of the camp are either fully vaccinated or will finish the vaccine series by the end of April. Most volunteers have also indicated that they are fully vaccinated. Rapp said some activities may need to be modified to work with the COVID-19 regime. Due to the volatility of the public COVID-19 response, Attendees are highly encouraged to avoid non-refundable tickets for transportation to Cincinnati, he advised. This would mark the first camp ever for you at Radio Amateurs and International Amateur Radio Union Region 2. For additional information, contact RAP. Here's this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. Please remember that the webinars are a member's only benefit. To register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions, please check the ARRL webinar webpage. HF Noise Mitigation, hosted by ARRL Northwestern Division Director Mike Ritz, W7VO, is scheduled to launch on Thursday, May 6th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 1930 UTC. This is an educational seminar to help both new and experienced HF operators who find themselves plagued with noise. We'll learn what noise is, discuss the various noise sources, and talk about how to mitigate those noises using a variety of techniques. W1AW Antenna Farm, hosted by W1AW Station Manager Joe Garcia, NJ1Q, is scheduled for Tuesday, May 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1700 UTC. During this webinar, you will experience a bird's eye view and description of the antennas used by W1AW for the station's scheduled transmissions and visiting operator activity. All the antennas used at W1AW are single band Yagi's. Viewers will also see the 5 GHz antennas that are part of W1AW's Arden system. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded learning network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. As always, the ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. Check the ARRL webinar webpage for any schedule changes. ARRL and the American Red Cross have renewed their long-standing Memorandum of Understanding for another five years. The Memorandum of Understanding spells out how ARRL and the American Red Cross will work cooperatively during a disaster response. We are pleased to extend our partnership with the American Red Cross, ARRL President Rick Roderick K5UR said. This agreement details how ARRL Amateur Radio Emergency Service volunteers will interface with the Red Cross personnel within the scope of their respective roles and duties whenever the Red Cross asks ARES volunteers to assist in a disaster or emergency response. 
The Memorandum of Understanding calls on both parties to maintain open lines of communication and to share information, situation, and operation reports as allowed to maintain confidentiality. They will also share changes in policy or personnel related to this MOU and any additional information pertinent to disaster preparedness, response, and recovery. AWRL and the American Red Cross also will encourage their respective units to discuss local disaster response and relief plans. They may further cooperate in joint training exercises and instruction. The Red Cross will encourage regions or chapters to participate in AWRL Field Day, the simulated emergency test, and other emergency exercises. This agreement keeps in place the strong and mutually beneficial bond between the AWRL and the American Red Cross, said ARRL Director of Emergency Management Paul Gilbert, KE5ZW. The Red Cross is a primary served agency for ARIES teams, and it's important that we are able to work together toward common goals when responding to an emergency. The agreement points out that any AWRL volunteers who are interested in also becoming Red Cross volunteers should understand that a background check is a requirement. Although ARIES has no background check requirement, radio amateurs who register as Red Cross volunteers must abide by the Red Cross's background check requirement. ARRL and the Red Cross also may cooperate in the sharing of equipment. A statement of cooperation between the two organizations at the local level may be developed separately from the MOU to spell out the role of each in providing services to communities during or after a disaster event. The new MOU was signed by Trevor Riggin, Senior Vice President, Disaster Cycle Services of the American Red Cross, and by ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR. Researchers have made a discovery that they say changes the shape of their search for the source of fast radio bursts from space. Fast radio bursts detected in space that appear to come from, well, no one quite knows. Scientists in McGill University's physics department have detected bursts down to 110 megahertz, a good deal lower in frequency than the previously detected 300 megahertz. Writing in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, the researchers write that this new discovery has led them to think differently about where the bursts are coming from. Using radio telescopes in British Columbia and the Netherlands, the team detected the significantly lower frequencies and a consistent delay of about three days between detection of the higher and the lower frequencies. They're still hot on the trail of the source of the bursts, but say that the ability to detect 110 megahertz transmissions brings them much closer to understanding things, especially one burst that was first detected in 2018 and is relatively close to Earth. The Straight Key Century Club is celebrating its 15th anniversary. It all began with a simple post in the QRZ.com forum about the ARRL Straight Key Night after it ended in 2006. Tom Peterson, KC9 ECI, wanted to see the event extended. He wrote, Do it the first of each month. Start your own SKCC club. 100 Qs with a straight key in a year gets a certificate. Ah, the heck with it. I'm officially starting the SKCC club. Since that day, the club has grown to over 24,000 members who are taking to the airwaves with straight keys, sideswipers, and semi automatic keys. Tom went on to say that he never thought the club would get this big. In fact, he's amazed. The success of the SKCC has less to do with me and everything to do with a great bunch of operators who are willing to step up. I just provided the spark of an idea. Members could work toward awards and participate in many activities, including a monthly sprintathon. The May Sprintathon, which starts at 1200 UTC on May 8th, offers bonus points for a contact made with any member who joined during the first year those with a number lower than 2,545. For more information and to register for a free membership, visit skccgroup.com. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Every year, professional and amateur tower climbers fall to their deaths. In most cases, these accidents were avoidable. Not too long ago, people in my community were shocked when a commercial tower climber fell to his death. 
according to our local paper. On April 21st, Jerry Trammell, 29 years old, not an amateur, of southern Indiana, fell from an older style microwave reflector tower where he was working with another climber. They were painting the tower. There is no way to prevent all accidents. That's why they call them accidents. As a tower climber, we can reduce them by following some simple safety guidelines. No matter if you're climbing up or down, a simple climbing procedure can dramatically reduce the risk of falling. The cost for this added safety is a slower rate of climb. First off, use the proper commercial climbing belt and attachment gear. Secondly, always wear a commercial climbing shoulder harness. Join the harness to your belt. And lastly, use a similar strap from your harness and attach it to the tower, but always to a different placement on the tower from your belt. This way, no matter which one fails, the other one is more than strong enough to hold your weight and that of your gear and cargo. With a dual strap attachment, you can climb up or down with two straps and always be attached to the tower. Using this method, the only thing that can injure you is a total failure of the tower or a near direct lightning strike. This may slow your vertical movement, but ask yourself this question. If I misplace a clamp, can I flap my arms fast enough to slow my fall to a safe speed? Let's review this simple procedure one more time. You will use two climbing straps to attach to the tower. Always clamp these two straps to different places on the tower, never to the same tower part. From a standstill, unhook one strap and step up one or two rungs until the other strap is around your knees. Then clamp the first strap as high as you can reach. Now, reach down and unhook the lower strap. Step up until the now higher strap is about knee height and reach up and clamp on with the loose one. By using shoulder harness and waist belts and using this method, you will always be connected to the tower while climbing. Remember to follow the dual attachment safety rule while clamped onto the tower when you intend to let go of the tower and lean fully into your belt. Always clamp onto two different places. When using duplicate strap attachments, you effectively reduce the chances of a fatal fall by nearly half. That's a cheap and cost-effective insurance policy you can write for yourself. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The German National Amateur Radio Society, DARC, reports that training for the German amateur radio licenses is now available online. Germany has two classes of amateur license, Class A, which is the full Harrick qualification with 750 watts output, and Class E, the novice, which is 100 watts output on four of the HF bands. Many dream of taking the amateur radio exam. It's certainly worth it because in the past few years, the diversity in amateur radio has grown steadily and new exciting opportunities are constantly being added. And according to the latest predictions, shortwave will be wide open again from autumn 2022 and then global connections will no longer be as troublesome as they are at present. And that will help new hams to get fully involved. Before being able to obtain an amateur radio license and call sign in Germany, it's necessary to pass the amateur radio examination. An online course that is currently being designed prepares amateurs for the exams, whether it's the simpler Class E or the full Class A. There is suitable training for both. You can take the course in the comfort of your own home using your own computer to connect to the online platform treff.darc.de. Homework will also be set between the evenings of the course. In this way, candidates actively work on the content at home and can continuously check their own learning status. More information is available on the course website www.delta25.de. The course starts on Thursday, April the 29th, and it's free. It should be noted that while training for the German exams is now online, the exams themselves are not. Exams still have to be taken in person at a limited number of exam sites run by BNETS A, the regulator. However, German amateurs are hoping for a change and have been requesting online examinations.
The WX4NHC annual station on the air test will be held on Saturday, May 29th from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time, that is 1300 to 2100 UTC. A formal announcement will be made soon. This hurricane season, WX4NHC operators plan to be working remotely again. The National Hurricane Center is planning to maintain all CDC pandemic protocols until the end of 2021. The National Hurricane Center is allowing only the main meteorologist and staff to enter the building. WX4NHC Assistant Coordinator Julio Ripoll, WD4R, said, Last year's season was an incredibly busy one, but the remote WX4NHC operations were successful, collecting many important reports via the Hurricane Watch Net, VOIP Hurricane Net, WinLink, the online hurricane report form, as well as many other means and modes. Ripoll offered his group's thanks to all who helped collect, send, and relay hurricane surface reports last season. The National Hurricane Center advises amateurs to be ready for hurricane season. Determine your personal hurricane risk, find out if you live in a hurricane evacuation zone, and review, update insurance policies. Make a list of items to replenish your hurricane emergency supplies and plan how you will prepare your home. If you live in hurricane-prone areas, you are encouraged to complete these simple preparations before hurricane season begins on June 1st. Adjust any preparedness actions based on the latest health and safety guidelines from the CDC and local health officials. Now is the time to harden and prepare your station for power outages. Have multiple sources of backup power, including batteries and gas power generators. Test them now. Ensure your ability to take down and put back up antennas quickly and efficiently when storms threaten your area. As a reminder, the Hurricane Watch Net on 14.325 MHz and 7.268 MHz is activated whenever a hurricane is within 300 nautical miles of expected landfall, disseminates storm information, and relays meteorological data to National Hurricane Center via embedded station WX4NHC also relays post-storm damage reports and other relevant information. Intercontinental Net operates from 7 a.m. to noon U.S. Eastern Time on 14.300 MHz, providing a means of emergency communications to any location where normal communications are disrupted. Marine Maritime Service Net also on 14.300 MHz. The network acts as a weather beacon for ships during periods of severe weather and regularly repeats high seas and tropical weather warnings and bulletins from the National Weather Service and the National Hurricane Center. Salvation Army Team Emergency Radio Network on 14.260 MHz. The purpose of the Saturn Net is to support the Salvation Army operations in local, regional, and international disaster situations. As previously reported, Belgium's communications regulator, the BIPT, will resume amateur radio exams from April the 26th, provided that the evolution of coronavirus continues to show reduced levels of infection. The Belgian National Society, the UBA, says that in order to keep the risk of infection as low as possible, the exams will be taken in writing. Any calculations must be performed on paper and the use of a calculator is not allowed. The difficulty of the calculations to be performed will be adjusted accordingly. Candidates must bring the necessary writing material with them. The rest is made available by BIPT. Be sure to bring at least a spare ballpoint pen and a pencil. Because of the COVID measures, you're not allowed to use writing materials borrowed from another candidate. A face mask obligation applies throughout the examination building, including the examination rooms, and social distancing rules must be observed. A negative COVID certificate is not required. The invitation that the candidates receive from the regulator will contain the special guidelines on how the candidate must register and participate in the exam. And you can register for the exams by email to exam at bipt.be stating your full name, postal address, telephone number and a copy of both sides of your identity card in attachment. For the Class C exam, which is the basic permit, you must also provide your certificate showing that you've passed the practical test. The digital transformation at ARRL headquarters is now underway, and you can be a part of it. 
The significant commitment of talent and investment is being made to develop a dynamic and responsive digital enterprise in the areas of amateur radio innovation and member engagement. This initiative is opening opportunities for experienced amateur radio enthusiasts to make ARRL the next stop in their career. ARRL is where vocation and avocation collide, said ARRL Chief Executive Officer David Minster in a 2AA. We're looking for people with passion, energy, drive, and talent to take ARRL to the next level. Opportunities are now on ARRL's website at www.arrl.org right slash careers. Both technical and non-technical positions are available now. With more on the horizon, not only are there full-time positions available, but we'll also be occasionally posting consulting or contract opportunities as we're now up for an IT project, said Minster. If you have amateur radio experience and a desire to work for ARRL, apply for one of the positions listed online, or submit your resume with a bio and a cover letter to hr at arrl.org. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. And finally this week, Star Waves, a German-Swiss developer and distributor of radio receiver technologies, is providing the first full-featured general DRM receiver application solution for Android phones and tablets. Star Waves enables Android phones and tablets to receive entertainment, text information, and emergency warnings via DRM radio. The Star Waves technology is based on the Fraunhofer technology and digital radio Mondial and is being pitched as the digital successor standard to the classic AM and FM radio service. Radio reception with mobile phones and tablets combines the mobility and flexibility of these devices with the benefit of free-to-air radio services. The Star Waves DRM soft radio app was developed in close cooperation with Fraunhofer. Its goal is to ensure easy access to innovative DRM radio services for everybody. It is available now in the Google and Amazon Android app stores. The app provides listeners with access to all the essential features of the DRM digital radio standard across all transmission bands from DRM on long wave to FM band and VHF band 3, Starwave says. Fraunhofer 2S is a significant co-developer of core digital radio technologies. This includes the innovative XHE-AAC audio codec, which provides high audio quality at lowest data rates, as well as the journal line application, which gives radio listeners access to news, the latest sports updates, local weather forecasts, travel tips, and even radio schooling services without requiring internet access. The app also supports many more DRM features such as the emergency warning functionality, image slideshows, station logos, and service descriptions including Unicode support for worldwide applications. To provide all these services, the app only requires a standard off-the-shelf SDRRF dongle that is attached to the device's USB port. We are proud to launch the world's first low-cost, full-featured DRM digital radio reception solution for mobile devices, developed in close partnership with Fraunhofer. 
Now everybody can easily upgrade their existing mobile phone and tablet to enjoy DRM Digital Radio with its undistorted audio quality and advanced features including Journaline, says Johannes von Weissenhoff, founder of Starwaves. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD Repeater System on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, Please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.